Welcome to SciShow Tangents, the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green, and joining me this week, as always, is science expert in Forbes 30 Under 30 Education Luminary, Sari Riley. Hello. And today, instead of that ding-dong Sam Schultz, Sam wrote this, I think. <laughs> I don't think anybody else would have called him a ding-dong. We have our other resident, usually behind the scenes, science expert. Oops, it's all science. It's Deboki Chakravarty. I feel like if I say hi, I'm co-signing, calling Sam a ding-dong. But hello. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Sam's not a ding-dong. He's a ding-dong in all the best ways. Yeah. I've got a question for you. Mm-hmm. Since before we started the podcast, we were talking about Worcester, Massachusetts. Yeah. What's the best sauce? Oh. I want to say like the green chutney sauce that you put on a samosa. Like I feel like when those mm. two meet, like that's mm-hmm. a very, very good sauce. Oh, no, I'm lying. I'm wrong. The best <laughs> sauce. <laughs> the best sauce is the chili crisp oil, the one that has like uh, the like old auntie on it, like in the red cap. That is the best sauce. That goes on everything. It belongs with everything. You should eat it with everything. It's good. Does it, what is it? What's it called? Lao Gama. Oh, yeah. L-A-O-G-A-N-M-A. Actually, if you search chili crisp oil, old auntie, it comes up. They know. Everyone knows. He's the one. Yeah. You know who that is. Yeah. I have never tried that, and I'm looking forward. I think Catherine will lose her shit over this. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it seems right up her alley. Yeah, it's great. It's like, because it's not just the taste. The flavor's great. The fact that it's oily is great. It's also the texture. It's like the crisp is crisp. So, like, it's mm. always nice. Like, if you put it on eggs or something, it's just oh. always, it just really makes it good all right sari come on with your irish blood (laughs) (laughs) yeah my favorite sauce is brown gravy which is up there actually uh i love gravy (laughs) but i think my favorite sauce my like favorite deluxe sauce is there is a diner ish place also in the boston area that makes a strawberry habanero like dipping sauce and it is basically jam, but with a little spiciness, and I think it's great. Mm-hmm. I've had it with cheesy French fries. I've had it with tater tots. I've had it with like also yep. potato products. So whatever you can dip a potato into to enhance the flavor is my favorite <laughs> sauce. I'm a big fan of calling it the best thing just based on how much I use it. So it's got to be the best. Like Otherwise, I'd use the other sauces. So the answer is honey mustard. <laughs> 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 ketchup was in there in the running yeah. for me yeah it's ketchup like... ketchup has been overtaken by honey mustard in my house for sure i i'm not like usually a ketchup person i have to like i i'm appreciating it more now it's that i'm weird. older because it's like oh yeah sometimes i need like a little bit of a tomato flavor i need mm-hmm. a little bit of an acid in my food but growing up i hated ketchup but you want that spicy chili crisp oh yeah yeah, yeah. i mean those are two completely different food groups <laughs> <laughs> those are two <laughs> like, yeah. like if ketchup was crispy maybe i would like it but <laughs> Mm, spicy crispy ketchup coming soon yeah from Pokey Chucker that, that sounds great <laughs> well i mean let's just mix them and see what happens yeah i think yeah. that's it i think more sauces should be crispy i yeah. feel like chili crisp has got the dominant crisp Speaking in the of, market oh, you, i'm sorry i whispered and i totally ruined sari's thought no that's okay you whispered but now i got a surprise me. package i don't even know how they got my address but it's from nabisco the creators oh. of Oreo, and it was a package of Oreos. And I was like, well, you didn't tell me you were sending me these, so I don't feel any obligation to make content around them. And so I just busted them open and had an Oreo. And then when I was finished with the Oreo, I was like, that was fine. And then my mouth started to bubble because there were Pop Rocks in the Oreo, oh. and I did not read the introductory oh. paragraph. <laughs> I was like, why is this so crunchy? <laughs> what oh. is happening to my mouth? <laughs> Do you not tear your Oreos apart? Oh, no. You're I put it in my mouth as fast as I could. Okay, okay. So, like, you had no way to prepare yourself oh, other than by reading <laughs> the letter. Yeah. Yeah. Other, <laughs> other, by that very by obvious the, way to prepare yourself. Yeah, taking the, the tiniest amount of preparation. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't sound like me. That is the purest Pop Rocks experience, though. Complete surprise. Surprise Pop Rocks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, think I can't wait to give one to Oren. <laughs> this is our new sauce line where we just mix in Pop Rocks as a secret <laughs> yeah. ingredient to every single sauce. That is like the one thing to take the chili crisp oil to the next level is like surprise Pop Rocks. I don't think you could put Pop Rocks in ketchup because ketchup has too much water and Pop mm. Rocks reacts with water. Fair. There's no water in chili oil. Yeah. So that's going to be a win for mm-hmm. me. This is why we need the material scientists to create a little like micelle yeah. kind of yeah. capsule. Exactly. Encapsulate... Yeah. Mm-hmm. The pop rock so that it dissolves in your tongue with your saliva enzymes, but not in the ketchup. 
We cracked go it. Scientists, go. It. Yeah. We could do it. I like the idea that this is our like uh, hot ones. So we're going to do the weird <laughs> chemistry experiment hot ones. Yeah. My new hot ones show where we eat cookies that on the inside, you don't know what there is. I think I would eat those cookies. Actually, I'm, I'd watch that show. Yeah. And it's very you. It's very on brand. Be like, yeah. I'm going to confuse you and mm-hmm. teach you something. Yeah. And you'll be like, this is very gross and I don't know what it is. And I'm like, it's chocolate chip and mustard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, billion dollar ideas out here. Uh, starting outside show tangents. Uh, this is a show where every week we get together to try to, to try to one up amaze and delight each other with science facts while also trying and failing to stay on topic. Our panelists are playing for Glory and for Hank Bucks, which I will be awarding as we play. And at the end of the episode, one of them will be crowned the winner. Now, as always, we're going to introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem this week from Devoki. I wonder what it would be like to have a body that's hormone-free. Would I hear my thoughts more clearly or know even less of me? Would I still know how to love without the oxytocin? And how would I spend my nights without some melatonin? And what does it mean when my mood swings and I do not feel like me? Yet through the haze of hormones, I find some clarity. It's hard to know where I end and where the body begins, where the fear is mine and of my mind. Oh, wait, maybe that belongs to adrenaline. Mm. Perhaps the answers cannot be found entirely in biology. I suppose these molecules help me live. But how is ultimately up to me. Hormones. The topic of the day is hormones, which I think we don't give them enough credit. They're (laughs) doing a lot of stuff in there. We're awful. We're awful focused on on the genome, I think, a lot of the times. Yeah. I think the hormones making a comeback, though. I think people are getting really into the hormones. We got to do the human hormone project. Yeah. I guess we know we know all the hormones, right? Do we know all the hormones in the people anyway? I mean, how do we know if we know all the hormones? I don't think so. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're missing a lot. Are we really? You think we're missing a lot of the hormones? Or like missing our understanding of molecules that act as like act, 20 yeah. different things as right. opposed to just they, one they, different thing. Yeah. The thing that you have to remember about your own goddamn body and all of the animals and plants and life is that n- nobody was thinking, here, we'll use this to do this. It was just like, whatever worked yeah. is what you end up with. Mm-hmm. And so things are reused in a thousand different ways. It makes no sense. But Sari, what is a hormone? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who really knows? Anyway, oh, gosh. they're also a kind of recent thing. Like the understanding of them? The understanding of them, yes. So the word yeah. hormone, I'm going to start with the etymology this time. The yeah. the first okay. hormone and the the word hormone was really um, like the idea of it was crystallized in like 1902 to 1905-ish. Uh, so there was an English physician named Ernest Henry Starling and a physiologist named William Bayless who were looking into like intestines and secretions and whatnot, like taking different organs that we thought would like control things in the body, like the thyroid and the spleen, and whatnot, extracting stuff from them and trying to figure out how these things worked. So it was just like, let's pull chemicals out and put them somewhere else and be like, a thing occurred. The chemical did it. Yep. The chemical did it. And now like, what are these chemicals? Mm -hmm. And at the time, at least the Pavlov school of thought, thought that um, like a lot of neural nervous system reactions controlled the entire body. So like neurons specifically, you thought something or whether it was conscious or unconscious, and then that controlled something. So like, for example, what they were studying was the duodenal, um, I think that's how you say it, duodenal, duodenal acidification. It's intestines, getting your intestines (laughs) all watery uh, is what they were studying. Uh Um, And they extracted something from the pancreas, which they called secretin, that even if all nerves were removed from an intestine, it induced an effect to, or like all nerves were blocked, that it induced that effect to have water flow in and out, like change the water balance. And so it was just this compound that induced that change in this body system. And so then they called it a hormone from the ancient Greek word hormone that means set in motion or to urge on. Hmm. So these, these compounds called hormones urge on another process within the body. And then from there, 
they kind of defined it as uh, anything in a human or animal body that regulates another behavior. (laughs) And Uh specifically, like starting with the idea that it was produced by a gland and then travels through the bloodstream and then has a a targeted effect somewhere else. And it has to be like a chemical that's separate from the cell because cells do that. Yeah. And I think that's where it gets yeah, we, like, is that why the gland is like kind of an important part of that definition, where it's like mm-hmm. made somewhere, Shugged sent out. somewhere else, sent somewhere else has that effect. But now our understanding of hormones has expanded and gotten so so blurry, where mm-hmm. it's just like any biological compound that is used to like organize or control or coordinate functions of any cells or tissues, and they can be created. From lots of different places, like we have the adrenal gland and we have the pituitary gland, but also fat cells create hormones that travel throughout the body. Um, Plants have phytohormones. So like ethylene Mm -hmm. gas is a hormone. Like a banana. Yeah. It can ripen because of a hormone sent through the air by a different banana. But because it still falls under that umbrella for like a a compound that causes a long-term change biologically. Are pheromones hormones then yeah it feels like that's probably why they have the own yeah it's a it's it's a combination of the greek uh convey fearin with hormone it's a conveying moan <laughs> and like an external maybe as opposed to an mm-hmm. internal and I, I then ethylene is external so maybe i don't know yeah. depending on who who you are and what you're studying i guess if you study humans then hormones are internal pheromones are external. But if you're studying plants, then all bets are off. This feels like one of those definitions that when we first came up with it, it seemed really clear that we should have Uh it. And then we learn more. And now it is confusing. Yeah. Well, even like the first hormone being named secretin Mm -hmm. is like, they thought that was genius. They were like, oh, this one, this one causes another, the the duodenum to secrete. You know what? No, no, no. My favorite (laughs) is relaxin, which is like one of the early pregnancy (laughs) hormones that literally just makes your like limbs just like weird and relaxed yeah they they called it relaxing (laughs) and you're like somehow that feels like an understatement uh, as a name yeah you got you guys ever get sort of upset that you're just a bunch of chemicals researching this episode absolutely there's so much Uh, some people sometimes people like are like the universe is so big and it's so upsetting to me and i'm like that's not Nope, that doesn't bug <laughs> yeah. me anymore. Nope. What bugs me, though, is I am like a bag of water. <laughs> yeah. I don't even have time to think about the universe. I'm having a crisis about myself. Yeah. I'm just a bunch of, I'm just yeah. a bunch of chemicals that, that can think about themselves. And somehow keep working together to doing the right yeah. thing. Like, mm-hmm. we don't even yeah. know what the right order of things is. Yeah. And it works, it works so well for so long. And, yeah. and then we die and people are like, what went wrong? And I'm like, I, I don't know. How did it go right? I got like disease is just like the most complicated thing on the earth not working quite right. Yeah. How did my cells divide correctly at every other point mm-hmm. in my life? Yeah. I mean, it makes total sense that if a cell line is able to make more of itself in my body, there would be more of it until I die. So hopefully the doctors got it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I feel like I don't know what a hormone is, but I also feel like I'm not supposed to, and nobody does. So we're going to be playing today a truth or fail, written by Sam Schultz. So just so everybody knows, he's still with us in one way. It is currently in the vicinity of Valentine's Day when you are hearing this, which means love either will be or is or was on your mind. Possibly. Maybe not. And I wanted to uh, celebrate that beautiful day of romance that either has happened or will happen imminently by presenting you with a Valentine's Day truth or fail featuring all of the hormones that make hearts and other stuff swell. (laughs) 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 Horrible, Sam. Horrible. (laughs) These are three facts and one of them is true. You guys know how truth or fail works. So our first fact. Tradition demands that at the beginning of a Valentine's Day date, flowers are gifted. A recent study has found that subjects exposed to the smell of certain flowers experienced an increase in the hunger hormone ghrelin. Scientists aren't totally sure why this response happens, but it does make that steak dinner you're about to have go down even easier. That might be a lie, though. It could be this one. Fact number two. So you're at dinner and your date slides a velvet box across the table to you and you open it to find a diamond necklace. How do you respond? The answer to that 
seems to depend on your age. In a 2017 study, scientists found that most baby boomer age participants experience a release of dopamine in response to the idea of receiving diamonds as a gift. Gen X and millennial participants, on the other hand, were far more likely to experience the release of the stress hormone cortisol in amounts that <laughs> increased as the participants' age decreased. Kids, turns out, hate diamonds. But that one might be a lie. It could be fact number three. Finally. After the flowers, the gift, maybe a romantic dinner, maybe Valentine's Day dates, move on to the next phase, cuddling. Cuddling <laughs> is a nice activity for a lot of reasons, but per a 2014 study, one lesser known benefit of holding your sweetie in your arms is that the so-called love hormone, oxytocin, is released while cuddling, and that can reduce swelling, improving bone health, and even help healed damaged muscle in your body. Maybe Wolverine from the X-Men healed so fast because he was in love all the time. But well, probably he wasn't able to heal when he was dating Rogue because they couldn't physically touch. I would have, sorry, that got too deep for the <laughs> crowd I'm in right now. That was just for Tuna. It would have been for Sam too, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. So which is the true fact? Is it that flowers make you hungry and we aren't sure why? The youth are stressed out by diamonds or cuddling increases your healing factor. I mean, the cuddling feels like the cat's purring thing, which I do feel like is a form of cuddling, but I just don't feel like that's what he's describing. Because that is the thing. Cats purring makes like help each other heal. Yeah. Supposedly. I read that in a, in a science fiction book. I wasn't sure if it was real. Yeah. I'm not sure either, but I just tell myself it's true when my cat sits on me and it feels yeah, real. Like I'm definitely healing. Right <laughs> yeah. <now. laughs> Nature is healing now. And it feels the most like ooey gooey Valentine's Day y also. Mm -hmm. of, like, yeah, oh, wouldn't yeah. that be nice if this is the true fact? The diamond study is weird. I mm -hmm. feel like it is totally a scientific study that people would do because everyone, like, very clickbaity, very easy to talk about, mm -hmm. very probably easy to get like relatively speaking, like funding for. From like the diamond industry, who's funding these studies? <laughs> Just the university? Like, yeah, they yeah, are using the same $5,000 <laughs> for that. Yeah. It feels like a behavioral <laughs> economist was yeah. like, yeah. I found yeah. it. Yeah, behavioral economists, I don't know how they fund their stuff, but I feel like it's selling books afterward. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's a great that's way to do mostly it. mostly what they do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I do feel like I haven't seen any Gen Z's killing diamond industry headlines yet. I have totally seen those. Oh, okay. There was, <laughs> there was like a millennials are killing the diamond oh, industry. Oh, yeah, yeah. I assume we're killing everything. Back. But I don't yeah. know like if Gen Z has gotten to that point yet where they get to kill yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. They'll Yeah, they're, all, they're right on the cusp. Yeah. Yeah. Flowers inducing hunger hormones is very funny to me. And yeah. I wonder if it has something to do with like spreading seeds or some like some sort of I don't know residual thing of being um, omnivorous is like oh I just want to eat that flower for some it reason. It also does seem like the kind of thing that would randomly be tested and randomly like be an effect that you would notice. Like I feel like I could just mm. like imagine someone being like I wonder what this flower would do to people. <laughs> I don't know that I would imagine them being like let's look at the hunger hormone, but yeah, yeah. let's just look at a hormone panel see what happens. If That's you look true. at enough of them, then you'll just pee hack it and end up with a study uh, like a result, even if there isn't one. <laughs> yeah. I guess I'm going to go with flowers because I want that one to be true. If it is the oxytocin one, I'm going to be a little bit mad at Sam because it's so. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to go with flowers, but I guess to spread it out, I will go with the cuddling one because All I right. feel like that feels more likely than the diamonds. So oxytocin is the hormone that generally increases social bonds, kind of makes you fall in love with someone. It's released in response to friendly physical touch, sex, after childbirth, in the birthing parent, and even when people see cute baby animals. And as we age, oxytocin production starts to drop off a bit. The same is also true in mice. And in a 2014 study from UC Berkeley, researchers injected oxytocin under the skin of older mice with muscle injuries. And after being injected, their damaged muscles healed at rates comparable to the speed at which muscle damage heals in younger mice. So, Deboki, congratulations oh, thank on your you. win. Sari, I'm sorry about doing the very thing you said was going to make you angry. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know, I, one of us, at least one of us won. I, I talked myself out of the right answer, which yeah. is pretty par for And it's oral. fine because you saved me from doing it. I was going to yeah. do it about five seconds before you. 
So I, I must continue to read what Sam wrote here. It, he says, when oxytocin production is blocked in young mice, they suffer premature aging, loss of muscle mass, and decreased bone health. So basically, this study found that oxytocin is vital for all kinds of tissue repair and plays a part in the aging process that doesn't seem to have been something that people knew about before the study. Uh, thus, cuddling may help you heal. And that's something you can actually like put in, say, like a pop science headline. Unfortunately, adding extra oxytocin to a younger mouse did not make them super healers, but this is still good news for all of us old people. The researchers suggested that anti-aging therapies using oxytocin could not just help people keep healthy for longer into their lives, but also treat diseases in which age seems to be a factor like Parkinson's. Wolverine, however, doesn't heal fast because he's always in love, but because of his X gene mutation, which in his case gives him the ability to heal several <laughs> thousand times faster than non-mutant humans, as well as just a really good sense of smell for some reason. The other two facts were just totally made up by Sam from the uh, the hormones mentioned and their general functions, because when it came to this topic, I was definitely over my head. I apologize if either of them were accidentally real. Love, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well sam didn't explain see it back to the genes i'm sure wolverine has at least one hormone <laughs> just the one in there just, just the one. one yeah there's gotta be yeah. some hormones it's gotta yeah happen. absolutely all right we're headed to the break with the bokeh in the lead we'll be back with the fact off SciShow Tangents is brought to you by Rocket Money. If I asked you how many subscription services you had, you think you could name them all? And before you just start naming streaming apps, remember that basically everything has a subscription these days. Video games, dating apps, food delivery apps. It's a subscription service world. We're just living in it. And with all of these subscriptions, it can feel like money is just flying out of your account. And that, frankly, sucks. But Rocket Money can help. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. Rocket Money can help you negotiate to lower some bills for you by up to 20%. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in total canceled subscriptions. Escape from the planet of the subscription services and stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash tangents. That's rocketmoney.com slash tangents. Rocketmoney.com slash T-A-N-G-E-N-T-S. SciShow Tangents is brought to you by Manukora Honey. Merriam-Webster defines honey as a sweet, viscid material elaborated out of nectar of flowers in the honey sack of various bees. And that's all good and fine, but old Miriam and Webster (laughs) used some words that I don't know and didn't really hit the mark when it comes to talking about Manukora honey. First off, Manukora isn't just sweet and viscid. It's got a rich, complex taste and a creamy, melt-in-your-mouth texture that you won't find in your average, everyday grocery store honey. And nectar of flowers doesn't cut it when you're talking about the nectar of the Manuka tea tree in New Zealand. The only nectar these bees feed on in the production of Manukora honey. In conclusion, Manukora ain't just your average boring dictionary defined honey. It's special honey. I know this firsthand. Uh, they sent us a jar, a squeeze bottle, and some honey sticks. And we've been sharing them around the office of their MGO 850 Plus, their best selling honey. It's not the same. <laughs> it's not what you're thinking of when you think of honey. Look, have you ever think to yourself, if like, a company made grapes for the first time, we'd go nuts. It's, I feel like honey is this way, where I'm like, if anybody like made this up, we'd be going out of our minds. But this is like if honey happened again. Did you like the honey, Sari? So I moved into a new place where there's no insulation in the walls. And so uh, I've been drinking a lot of tea. And mm-hmm. sometimes that tea needs a little bit of honey. And I initially poured in this honey thinking it was going to be grocery store honey. And then I was like, that's different. And now it's a little uh, breakfast treat. It's a great breakfast treat because it's 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 a little like it's for toast. I could put like this on my butter toast and I'm like, oh, I'm having an experience. So Merriam-Webster also defines ultimate as the best or most extreme of its kind. Now that one fits Manukora to a T. Indulge in the best or most extreme sweet viscid material elaborated out of nectar of flowers in the honey sack of various bees. 
from Manicora. If you head to Manicora.com slash tangents, you can get $25 off their starter kit, which comes with the MG850 Plus Manuka Honey, a free travel pack of honey sticks, a free wooden spoon, and also a free guidebook. That's M-A-N-U-K-O-R-A dot com slash tangents to get $25 off your starter kit. Hey, Siri. Yes, Hank? <laughs> Do you like to learn stuff while you watch YouTube videos? I love to. I've, I loved it so much. I made it my career. What if you could get college credit for doing that thing that you love doing? That would be absolutely wild. I would have gotten a head start on college and high school, probably. Well, with the YouTube series Study Hall, can you believe that you could do just that? If we were to read an ad read for my own thing that I've worked for years to create, but here's how it yep. works. <laughs> <laughs> you can head to the Study Hall channel and watch the, the course videos for free at youtube.com slash study hall. And then you can sign up for an online college course led by Arizona State University faculty for just $25 and apply what you have learned. And if at the end of the course, you're happy with your grade, you can pay $400, about a third of the cost of a normal college course. And now you have three transferable college credits on your transcript. And there are all kinds of courses available, like the Code and Programming course that teaches beginners with no coding experience how to develop Java programs. Throughout the course, you'll write simple code that gets the computer to do complex tasks like data management. And the course videos for Code and Programming are hosted by the delightful Sabrina Cruz of the YouTube series Answer in Progress. And they were all edited by someone whose name rhymes with Gary Smiley, who may be a <laughs> 30 under 30 Forbes luminary. So whether you are trying to learn new skills, earn college credit, or just prove to yourself that you could do it, Study Hall can help you reach your goals without the financial risk. Check out the link in the description or go to gostudyhall.com to learn more. That's G-O studyhall.com. Welcome back, everybody. Now get ready for the fact off. Our panelists have brought in science facts to present in an attempt to blow my mind. And after they have presented their facts, I will judge them and award them any way I see fit. But to decide who goes first, I have a trivia question. In 1997, the Galapagos island of Pinta had a big problem. In 1959, three goats had been released onto the island, and in their intervening years, their population had exploded to the point where they were eating the native species out of house and home and threatening to destroy the island's ecosystem. So scientists and conservationists decided to do something about these goats once and for all, launching Project Isabella, a huge ecological restoration effort that, simply put, uh, involved loads of people scouring the island, shooting any goat they found. And to draw the goats out, they used so-called Judas goats, female goats who were sterilized and injected with hormones that made them uh, be permanently in heat and irresistible to male goats. By 2006, with the combined efforts of bullets and hormones, the goat scourge of Pinta had been completely eliminated. The question is, approximately how many goats were killed by Project Isabella? Sad, horny goat slaughter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is opposite of cuddling. Sam really had a lot of whiplash yeah. here, being like, oh, it's so cute. And then now, yeah. murder goats. These poor goats, the, the female goats, I feel almost worse for. Just like right. going from place to place, drawing men out, and then being yeah. like, ah, Jeremy, ah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to go with 700. I feel like that's 700 just, goats. That's the number. Oh, I think it's like 50,000. <laughs> There's got to be a lot of goats on the island. This is this is uh this is interesting. This is interesting. I think seven hundred they probably could have put away pretty quick, but one hundred and forty thousand goats oh, might oh. take a decade. Yeah, that that tracks. They killed one hundred and forty thousand goats. How <sighs> many how many sterilized females did they need for that? That seems know. like a lot. I I don't know how big this island is, but how do you fit that many goats on an island? I mean, I guess mm. they're like still making more goats as you're killing them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a one way thing. And they killed them to like completion, like the population was gone yeah, completely. They're, they're, they have extincted the goats on the island. Wow. Yeah. Which is not easy to do, but when it's an island, it's easier. Sometimes yeah. people will say this about like, why don't we just kill all the wild boars in America? And I'm like, ha! Because <laughs> yeah. no, like it's not ever going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or like yeah. mosquitoes or something like that. Right, it's like, yeah. we can try our best, but they, can fly yeah. and yeah. They like <laughs> hide in little broods. things, hide in yeah. cargo. Yeah, like a goat 
Not going to be able to get very far without a human yeah. seeing it. All right. So that means that Sarah gets to go first. So our nervous system is basically in a tug of war between the parasympathetic or the rest and digest system and then the sympathetic fight or flight system. And hormones can sway our bodies one way or another. And when it comes to stress, the big name players are usually the adrenal gland and a group of hormones called glucocorticoids, which in humans includes adrenaline, aka epinephrine and cortisol that amp up our heart rates and increase energy availability and all those things. But in a September 2019 paper, a team of researchers published um, some results that point to another key player in how we experience stress, our bones. So it can be kind of easy to forget that bones are living tissue full of blood vessels and living cells and nerves, in addition to being these hard calcium-based minerals. But they are. Some of the cells in bones are called osteoblasts, which secrete lots of different proteins involved in bone growth and calcification and whatnot, including what some scientists think is a bone-derived hormone called osteocalcin, which is very weird because bone is not a gland. It's one of these other things in our bodies that might secrete hormones. Mm. Side note that as I was digging into this fact, I found papers from the last few years with scientists arguing about whether osteocalcin is in fact a hormone that has effects on other non-bone systems like glucose metabolism or muscles or brains. And honestly, my takeaway is that the endocrine system is complicated and hard to study. This like really informed my definition section at the beginning where I was like, no one knows what a hormone is. The hormone scientists <laughs> uh-huh. are arguing with each other. Yeah. They're being kind of rude about it too. Good. Like These are some <laughs> spicy papers back and yeah. forth of people being like, Wild. some they have accused it. me of saying that <gasps> this is. Mm-hmm. As soon as the some have accused me comes out, I'm like, all right, take it down a notch. Yeah. <laughs> I- Maybe we're just, maybe it's okay. It's also funny to me because I feel like often scientists use some as like a very hedging thing, but this is very pointed. Like some (laughs) have accused me. Mm -hmm. So I stepped into a can of worms with osteocalcin, but this is still a fun study. So I'm going to talk about it. So in this 2019 paper, scientists tested a variety of stress conditions in a couple different animals, mice or rats who had been restrained by putting them into small tubes with air holes. Uh, Mm -hmm. Mice who received electric shocks to their little feet. Mice who smelled a compound in fox urine that is known to cause a fear response. And humans who were either cross-examined or had to do public speaking, which I think is very funny to, like, compare (laughs) mice being shocked on their feet to, like, humans who had to give Uh a speech. Uh Sounds Um, right, though. Yeah. I mean, if they could make mice give a speech, they would have done that. (laughs) Sweaty palms and then a little shock. Um, But across all these experiments, there was a release of osteocalcin in addition to stress reactions like increased heart rate and blood pressure, um, and that osteocalcin was biologically active, basically meaning it was in a form that is known to do things and bind to cell receptors in the body. They compared genetically altered mice, who are some that could make osteocalcin, um, to others that couldn't, and their stress responses to try and figure out what exactly it was doing in the body. And basically... They think it inhibits the parasympathetic nerves and their signals to slow down breathing and heart rate and whatnot. So it's not like powering up the fight or flight response like cortisol does. But if you imagine that like tug of war between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, it's making the parasympathetic response weaker. So the sympathetic response, that fight or flight Mm. is winning a little bit better. Mm. And at its most extreme conclusion, if you're writing a pop science like Uh, Mm -hmm. extreme article about it you can say our bones make us stress and panic and avoid danger and like (laughs) your skeleton gets scared doing so much stuff yeah my bones are scared (laughs) why are you so worried when you're about to do public speaking my bones literally Mm -hmm. my bones are scared of this yeah yes my bones are scared why bones why use bones why not they're there and if they can do it i guess i think that it's, it's just around but yeah, our, our bodies are more interconnected than we thought because it's it's weird and our bones are just also playing a role. They secreted this compound and I think it does like help maybe with bone growth too, but then it also, we just evolved receptors. How do my bones know when I, my little feetsies are being shocked? Other hormones, I think, probably. Yeah, probably I think hormones. it's it's like in conjunction with other hormonal responses. Like it's not the only thing that goes sure. on. There's, yeah. So there's also like adrenaline and cortisol going on. I wish... That we knew more. (laughs) Yeah. 
I want to know about my stressed out bones because I feel it. I feel stressed yeah. out in every pore of my body. Yeah. Be, yeah. Now that, yeah. Now that you say it, it does feel like my bones are worried. Yeah. Sometimes I get kind of caught up on the fact that like the, the, the body of science is limited by the number of people doing science. And I'm like, mm-hmm. more people need to be doing science. And the number of, the amount of funding we have for people to do science. Yeah, I was going to say, I think there are a lot of people who want to do the science. Yeah, yeah who, who aren't able to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bullshit. Wow. All right. What do you got, Dabogi? I have another mystery hormone mystery. situation. Okay. So babies are notoriously bad at telling the time. In general, they <laughs> don't care. <laughs> I honestly, that you say it's notorious, but that's the first I've heard of that. <laughs> Never been reported before. Um, <laughs> they don't. They don't, when they're born. They don't usually care about morning or night. They just want yeah. food when they want food. Yeah. Over time, they gotcha. do develop a circadian rhythm. So yeah. they they learn about things like light cues and the timing of when they're fed. And so that's great for everyone involved. Um, but there's still a lot that's mysterious about how they figure out a circadian rhythm. But hormones in breast milk bite might be a part of it. So over the course of the day. Breast milk actually changes. There are nutritional changes like iron levels usually apparently peak around noon, but also there are hormone changes. In the morning, breast milk tends to contain more cortisol, which I think we've talked about. It's a hormone tied to alertness. And in the evening, breast milk tends to have more melatonin, which is a hormone that helps with sleep and digestion. So the idea is that for babies that are breastfed, that breast milk might actually be kind of teaching them the difference between morning and night by like teaching them when they should be more alert versus when they should be asleep which is a form of something that scientists call uh, chrononutrition, which is generally interested in this idea of how to coordinate food with a person on, with a person's internal clock. And it's something that's studied in a variety of contexts and usually in adults, but this is the interesting baby <laughs> context. Mm-hmm. And it's also particularly interesting in a modern context because we're living in an age where you can pump breast milk and refrigerate it and store it for later, whereas generally for most of the existence of humans, Babies that were being breastfed were being breastfed the the milk as it was being produced. So they were basically getting breast milk with like that specific times hormone signatures. So there's this potential idea that scientists have become interested in that maybe one way that babies now are having their circadian rhythm get like kind of maybe thrown off is they're being fed breast milk that was pumped in the morning, but they're being fed it in the evening and or vice versa. And so that could be causing their circadian rhythm to get mixed up. So there's this idea that maybe one way to like help prevent that is to like kind of just store morning milk for morning and evening milk for like evening milk feeds, Mm -hmm. Uh, though it's still like not very well understood or well studied. And there are a lot of questions about how breast milk even develops this pattern and whether it's based on like the internal clock of the person doing the breastfeeding or if it's like other Mm -hmm. behaviors, like when they're sleeping or eating food. So there's a lot that's still mysterious about it. So is that, does that mean that there's like to, to go follow the theme of the episode and also of all of our lives, is that like the pop science article version of this is like you have to give your baby the breast milk from the night at night? Well, definitely the scare tactic version to make people feel terrible about uh-huh. how they're like, I because I think most of the Internet like that's geared towards parenting is really geared towards yeah. guilting parents yeah. is being like you are feeding your baby the wrong breast milk. Like you could be doing uh-huh. breast milk wrong, too. But that's not the case. People just <laughs> whatever works, works. Whatever works, works. This is yeah. like the main takeaway of everything to do with parenting. <laughs> yeah. Um, sweet. Cool. Weird. So either I have to pick between um, breast milk helping to establish the circadian rhythms of babies or my bones are scared. <laughs> <laughs> Losing out fear. This is tricky. They seem very equal to me, but Deboki came out on top in the first one. So I'm going to we're going to give Deboki the win for the episode. Yay. <laughs> Teaching us the word chrononutrition, yeah. which yeah. is my new favorite term of like, it really is. I, I will never be able to use it, but I will just yeah. whip it yeah. out as like science communication jargon of like, yeah. oh, I mean, an Oreo right now, a pop rock Oreo right now for yeah. chrononutrition. Yeah. That's yeah. I feel that. like breakfast is chrononutrition. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's the most important meal of the day Yeah, for chrononutritional reasons. I did see a YouTube video that was like, you're taking your supplements wrong. You should be taking them based on the time of day. And I was like, wow, (laughs) wow, here we are. Yeah. (laughs) 
I'm like, I'm trying to <sighs> not eat Oreos for lunch. Okay. <laughs> like you, we're not at, we're not at you taking your supplements at the wrong time of day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We, we are at go outside sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm at, uh, take a break for lunch. Remember yeah. to take your meds at some point during the turn yeah. 24 hour period. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, drink water. Yeah. Not a particular amount. Any amount. Any amount. Yeah. Reduce the headache. <laughs> well, congratulations to Pokey on the win. And now it is time to ask the science couch where we ask a listener question to our extra finely honed couch of scientific minds. At CrystalR99 on Twitter asked, why does an influx of hormones affect mood so much? Are emotions just a specific elixir of hormones? Hmm. We really need all three science brains on this because uh, yeah, this feels uh, like a philosophy question. <laughs> I think that the problem is, is the illusion that our self exists because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we observe it like yes. we're connected to it i i observe myself i have like a pretty strong understanding of what it is uh but it's but i don't think i but i but uh, if, if i look too hard i will notice that like myself is different based on what i what i've whether i've eaten recently so i'm i'm affected by the what my body is doing and my mind is part of that like, like throughout the month or throughout various different circumstances. Uh, yeah, like I'm going to be different based on the, the cocktail, the blood cocktail in my body. Yeah. You're more like a, yeah, I guess you're, you are a cocktail, but also like a cauldron, like a bubbling cauldron of mystery goo. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because a cocktail, you know what's in it. C cauldron you have no idea what's in there <laughs> always a mystery if yeah. a witch says what's in her cauldron she's lying uh, lie. you never know <laughs> <It> always lies <laughs> yeah. yeah so i feel like yeah. that's it like I <laughs> yeah because one of the trippiest experiences for me as like an adult was like finding out like i had to like take thyroid medication and like then taking the medication and being like oh right so i was really just angry and tired because of mm. this like hormone mm -hmm. issue and it was like huh so like i felt completely different for reasons that were like not like they were me but they weren't me like they were also the hormone and like it was very weird to have that experience and then just be like oh all it took was just like a little bit of hormone and now now it's all good like what was that about <laughs> is that okay <laughs> yeah 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 mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean that's that is it. Th thyroid is one of the ones on my list. I just like grabbed random ones. I googled mm -hmm. like a hormone that I can think of and mood and dug in. So if you want to dig more into this topic yourself, uh, the source list for this Ask the Science Couch very robust. Um, <laughs> but the but the like we don't know why it happens. Just that it happens. Yeah. Like that. This is one of those things in science that we really. It's two things that we really don't have a good grasp of, which is like the biochemistry of communication in our body, which is hormones, but also neurotransmitters and like kind of the blurry line between them where we generally categorize like nervous system is really rapid transmission, like fractions of a second of information. Um, neurotransmitters are the, the compounds that help transmit information from neuron to neuron or those like short distance very quick. Whereas the endocrine system and hormones are more like long distance, stick around a little bit longer in the blood or other body regions, um, maybe have a more widespread effect on the body. But then you look at molecules like serotonin, which have both these like neurotransmitter effects, high like short bursts, doses, like effects on the neuro, like your brain. Um, and you have it working in the gut to like activate gut metabolism or your eyes and activate muscle fibers in your eyes. Um, or like it affects insulin secretion and insulin is another hormone in your body. And so it's all these interconnected things. And like the brain is an organ, um, in addition to being part of the nervous system. So mm -hmm. it all just kind of overlaps. Um, and when you dig into any sort of like serotonin, testosterone, estrogen, thyroid hormones, any of these things, um, you can find review papers of studies where they, they like take people 
and they measure their hormone content and they say they average it out and they go, okay, well, this seems to be like, quote unquote, normal range of mm-hmm. testosterone or estrogen for at this right. time for this, this subset of people um, constrained by age and gender and weight and uh, race and all these other cofactors. And the people who have slightly more report on their self administered mood surveys that they feel more angry or happy or sad. Uh, And the people who have less report feeling more angry or happy or sad. And here's our result. And (laughs) what do we do with that? (laughs) So it's hard to draw like patterns with that where Mm -hmm. there are some studies that are like, well, it seems like in menopause when people whose bodies like normally produce estrogen on a cycle all of a sudden are missing that estrogen then replacing that can help stabilize mood but like there are so many confounding factors yeah emotions are weirdly robust i guess too like the the things that the hormones do are like often not down like kind of like you're saying like to one hormone it's like the, the their effects are like often built on like a really complex system and so it's complicated it's complicated yeah. it's very weird uh and we killed 140,000 goats <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we sure did. We sure did. If you want to ask the science guy your question, sorry we weren't <laughs> super great at that one. Turns out hormones not easy. You can follow us on Twitter and Threads at SciShow Tangents, where we will send out topics for upcoming episodes every week. Or you can join the SciShow Tangents Patreon and ask us on our Discord. Thank you to at Charlie Crossing on Discord, at CJ Gallagher fifty five on Twitter, and everybody else who asked us your question for this episode. If you like this show and you want to help us out, it's really easy to do that. You can go to patreon.com slash scishowtangents to become a patron, get access to our Discord and our bonus episodes, and also our Minions commentary, which is a real thing that I, I think exists by now. We've definitely recorded it. I think it's out. Shout out to patron Les Aker also for their support. Second, you can leave us a review wherever you listen. That's super helpful and helps us know what you like about the show. And finally, show you love the SciShow Tangents. Just... Tell, Tell people, people about, about us. Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. And I'm Devoki Chakravarty. Social Tangents is created by us and produced by Jess Stemper. Our associate producer is Eve Schmidt. Our editor is Seth Blitzman. Our social media organizer is Julia buzz Our editorial assistant is sometimes Devoki <laughs> Chakravarty. Uh, and sometimes Sam Schultz, occasionally. Our sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. Our executive producers are Nicole Sweeney and me, Hank Green. And of course, we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you, and remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire. But, one more thing. Lots of rodents are nocturnal, including spiny mice that live in hot, rocky deserts in Egypt and nearby countries. Except when two different spiny mouse species are fighting for the same territory. When that happens, the golden spiny mouse reluctantly forages in the daytime instead. And I say reluctantly because even when they're foraging in the bright sun every day, their natural hormone cycles are still synced to the moon. In a 2011 study, researchers found that all golden spiny mice have higher levels of cortisol metabolites in their poop during the full moon because that stress hormone can help them stay extra wary of nocturnal predators like owls during a bright moonlit night. Stress is in your bones and your poop. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely in your poop. Everything's in the poop. All hormones are in your poop and piss. Definitely, Uh, 100%. We're a cauldron.